Greetings everybody and welcome back to another Manifold's video. It's been like five months or so since my last one and this is probably time that I continue this series again because there's a lot more to cover and a lot more cool stuff that I am yet to go through. So what are we doing today? We're taking a look at this tangent space basis. In the previous video, we took a look at what we had a manifold, a smooth manifold that comes with, equipped with a smooth atlas. And then we went to a point on the manifold and then we asked the question, well, what are the tangent vectors at that point? And then we realized that, well, the only really useful notion of a tangent vector at a point is the directional derivative of a function going along that direction there. So if you want, we can draw out a little bit of a picture of what we did last time. So here was um, some manifold, I'll just draw a circle because I'm lazy. And then what we did was we went to a point a P on a manifold and we constructed these smooth curved gammas and I completely missed that point there, so I'll draw it again. So we considered these smooth curved gammas through the points and then each smooth curve through a point P induces some kind of directional derivative operator which we draw as an arrow over here. Now it's not really an arrow sticking out of your manifold, um, it's because we're thinking about our manifold intrinsically, which means it's not embedded in some higher dimensional space. And um, this is just for imagination or illustration purposes. And then you can say, well, what are the sets of all the tangent vectors at this point? So you have tangent vector pointing in all sorts of direction. And this gives you some sort of um, well, tangent space over here, which you can think about as a tangent plane. But again, just for illustration purposes, um, you should really think about each of those tangent vectors as directional derivative operators. And the set of all those derivative operators at the points P, we give it the name T um, for tangent at the points P of the manifold M. Okay, so this is this vector space. We can show that it's a vector space. Um, technically, I haven't proved that it's a vector space yet, um, namely the closure properties of the set here. I haven't quite shown. Maybe I'll do it in the next video. Um, but we can take this as our vector space. And what we're going to do today is we're going to construct a basis for this guy. And in the specific basis we're going to construct is the so-called chart-induced basis. So maybe that gives you an idea of how we're going to construct it. Okay, so let's draw a proper manifold picture over here because this one's already a bit messy. So we have our manifold at M over here and but we're, we want to go to a point P that we're interested in. Let's say this is the point P here. And the question is, um, well, the tangent space at this point here, can we figure out if there's a nice way to construct a nice set of, well, first of all, linearly dependent tangent vectors and also it spans the whole entire space. And we want to use do this using these charts here. So first of all, why not introduce a chart. So we're going to let, let's say a chart u comma x from this smooth atlas that comes equipped with this manifold here. So it's manifold, we have the topology and the smooth atlas. That's the, that's the triple that defines the manifold. So this is our chart here. And this chart, obviously it has to contain the point P, otherwise it will be a little bit useless. So in this picture over here, maybe this is this is our chart here. And without loss of generality, what I'm also going to assume is that X, X maps the points P here exactly to the origin in the chart. So if you imagine a map down into the chart here, so let's say this is the chart, um, the points zero, zero, or a bunch of zeros, the origin, this would be the image of the point P. So we're going to assume X of P is equal to zero, um, without loss of generality, of course, because if it's not equal to zero, you can always just do a translation on your chart. Okay, and where do we go from here? Well, you may notice something. If you kind of lift these chart axes back up onto the manifold, what exactly do you get? Well, these chart axes, they'll become like these these nice smooth curves through a manifold, which is quite nice because once we have smooth curves through a point P, well, we can produce some tangent vectors, which is quite nice. And it turns out if you use these smooth curves here, um, so if you imagine lifting these chart axes back up to the manifold, if you use these smooth curves to produce your tangent vectors, um, which you may think about like something like this over here, it turns out these tangent vectors are precisely the basis we're after, and that's what we're going to prove today. So first of all, let's try to write down these these curved gammas over here. And I'm going to define these over here. So we're going to define some smooth curves in the manifold. I'm going to call them gamma i. Okay, so this is going to be a map. We're just going to take r. Oh, technically, it's supposed to be some open interval, but i um, lazy to do things properly. Maybe I should be doing things properly. So let's just take r, and this goes into, well, it's gonna be this chart domain u over here, which is a subset 
m. Okay, so how does this map work over here? Well, I want to move my parameter in my charts domain along only one axis, and then I'm going to lift it up via the charts x inverse. So this is the charts x that goes down. I want to lift it up via the map x inverse back into the manifold. So it's really a map from R, which we can move around down here, into the manifold M up over here. Okay, so let's define this is going to be some lambda parameter. This is going to get mapped to, okay, well, I want to, this is the ith curve over here. So I really want to move in the ith direction. So that means I want to have, let's say, zero. So I'm going to fix all the other components to be zero. Um, so dot, dot, dot. And then I'm going to put a lambda here, and then the rest is going to be zero. So if you imagine what this is doing in the chart, all these other axes, except for the ith one, we're keeping at zero, um, but then only on the ith direction, we're moving our parameter along this axis here. Okay, but this is still living in the chart. We want to lift it back up into the manifold, so I'm going to apply the map x inverse to this whole entire guy over here. And this is going to define these curves in gamma i's that we want. There's a few more other ways I want to formulate this map gamma i, or these smooth curves gamma i's. Notice that we're only picking out the i-th components over here, so this is really the i-th slot. Um, what we can do is we can map, so this is equal to, you can write it as x inverse, but now notice it's zero everywhere except for the i-th slot. So we can use the, the Kronecker delta here. You can say Kronecker delta of one, um, and then we have an i down here, and then put a lambda. So when i is equal to one, you pick up a lambda, otherwise it's a zero, that's the Kronecker delta, and then you go all the way up until you get to delta, and how many components are there in this chart? Well, there's exactly dim and many components, that's how the dimension of the manifold is defined in terms of these charts here. Okay, and then we have a lambda here. So when your i, oh, I forgot an i here, so when your i matches with whatever index is at the top, over here, your Kronecker delta turns on, and then you pick up that lambda there, otherwise it's exactly equal to zero. Okay, and you may notice one thing here, what happens if you take x, let's say the eighth component of your chart map, so the eighth component, and then you compose it with gamma i. Well, this is going to give you, well, as a map, um, well, if you apply it to lambda, this is going to give you um, xa after x inverse. But that's, if you go x inverse up to here, and then you take xa back, that's exactly the projection onto the eighth component. So what's the projection onto the eighth component here? Well, it's going to be exactly delta a, because we're on the eighth component, i, and then the lambda. So you notice xa, if you really want to write this as a map here, xa after gamma i, this is going to be exactly um, Kronecker delta a i times the identity, a lambda came from r, so this is the identity map on r. So we are going to use this again, probably when we do some proofs that this tangent basis thing is indeed a basis. Okay, so we have our, we have our curves over here defined. These are the curves that are gonna run through the manifold. There's dim m many of these curves, so these are all our gamma i's here. And now, once we have these curves, we're going to try to construct the tangent vectors from these curves. So let's try to do that. So tangent vector time. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to try to understand the tangent vector x generated by the curve gamma i, but then at the point of p. So we usually write it like this, I'm pretty sure I wrote it like this in the previous video anyways. And now we want to understand this guy. Okay, so what's the best way to understand the tangent vector. Well, we're just gonna let it act on some smooth function. Let's call it f. So I'm gonna let it act on f. So this guy, this f over here, this is an element of c infinity. Um, technically, it has to be u, but let's just say c infinity m, doesn't really matter. Okay, so how does this guy act on f over here? Well, we remember how the tangent vector is defined. It's f after the curve that it's produced by. So f after gamma i, and then what we do is we take the derivative of this guy and then we evaluate it at, and then well, what parameter value does our curve hit p? Well, it's exactly zero because we assumed it over here. So we're going to evaluate this guy at precisely equal to zero. Okay, um, but well, I wanna get rid of this gamma i over here. I don't want to have a curve sticking around every, everywhere. So what's the best way to get rid of this gamma i? I'm going to introduce an identity map over here. And it's a very specific identity map, a specific way to write it. Um, I'm going to write this guy. Let's put a line here. Sorry, we don't 
have confusion. So what we're going to do is I'm going to write this as f after. I'm going to insert x inverse after x. So this is the identity here. And then I'm going to compose with the gamma i prime at zero. Okay. And what we can do now is we can kind of split this up into two parts because notice um, this guy, f after x inverse, that's exactly a map from r to the dim m, which I'll just write as rd, into r. And how about x after gamma i? Well, gamma i took in a single real number, and then this x here is going to give us something in rd. So that's this guy over here. And we're differentiating a map that goes from r to rd, then rd to r. So we have to remember how to use the multivariable chain rule here. And um, so let's remind ourselves of how that works there. So how I like to think about this is, well, we have, we have like one variable over here, and then in the intermediate step, we have a bunch of variables. So these are d variables over here, and then you go back to being one variable. And you want to differentiate this composition somehow, so how do you do that? So this is the outermost function here. What we do is we differentiate with respects to each of these intermediate components. So what would that look like? That's going to look like, let's say, delta a, so del a, the derivative, partial derivative with respect to the eighth component of f after x inverse. Okay, but then chain rule says you differentiate the outside guy and then you keep the inside the same. So we're going to evaluate um, everything on the inside here at zero. So gamma i of zero, we assume that's e exactly equal to p. Then we have x of p. So we evaluate at x of p here. Okay, and then the second part of chain rule says for each of these intermediate variables we differentiate it with respect to here, we're going to differentiate it with respect to the input variable. So what would that look like? It's going to look like x after gamma, um, but I'm only concerned about the eight components of this guy because I differentiate the eight components through the input variable. Um, a nice way to write this is instead of taking gamma and then applying x to it, you can just apply the eight component of x to gamma once you compose it. So that just picks up the eight components, which is what we're after. We take this guy and then we differentiate and then you evaluate at precisely zero. Okay, I believe this should be correct over here. So notice we also have to do a sum as well. So you multiply these outer components with the inner component. Um, you do these products over here, then you have to sum all the all the derivatives together. But notice we're using the Einstein sum notation here. And notice because we have a lower index a, and then this up index a over here, there's an implicit sum on the a variable. So if you want to, you can write um, a, a sum running from a equals one to dim m out the front over here, but because there's an up, a down and an up index as a sum implicitly. Okay, so once we have this, let's try to simplify things a little bit. I want to simplify this, this back end over here. Notice we have, oh, I forgot an i, so this is gamma i. Notice we have xi after gamma i, but we know what that is over here. I just described it. That's Kronecker delta times the identity map. So this guy over here, we can just simply replace this um, with Kronecker delta ai identity on r. Okay, but the question is, what's the derivative of Kronecker delta times the identity? Well, the derivative of the identity is precisely equal to 1. So if you take the derivative, you're just left with the Kronecker delta because that Kronecker delta is a constant. But then you evaluate the whole guy at 0. So Kronecker delta evaluated at 0. It's just a constant, so it's still going to be Kronecker delta. So this whole entire part at the end over here, this is just going to give you one big Kronecker delta um, AI. So let's... Let's put it up over here. So this whole part is going to be Kronecker delta AI. Okay, but now notice we still have this lower index contracted with this upper index here. We're contracting with the Kronecker delta. So that kills off all these products where A is not equal to I. So what you're left with is del, and then you're only left with the ith derivative here, f after x inverse, and then you have x of p. Okay. So if you take your tangent vector that's generated by this curve gamma i, you act on this function, this is what you get over here. And in fact, there's a special symbol we give for this. It's actually just a symbol. It's not doesn't really mean anything, really. It's just a definition, a symbol. And we define this object over here to be equal to, well, notice you're taking the derivative with respect to the i component 
of this function f, pretty much, but in the, in the chart representation. So you write this guy as Adele, you, you're differentiating f in its chart representation, which is x, so del x down here. You're differentiating with respect to the ith component, so you put an i up over here, but then you're evaluating at the chart representation of the point p. So you take this guy, you put it in brackets, and then you put a p down over here. So this is merely notation. It doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean partial derivative of f with respect to xi, because that doesn't really make sense, because f is a function on the manifold. It, doesn't have these xi components anywhere. In fact, it turns out, I believe if your manifold is identically equal to rd, then this kind of does make sense because you can treat these xi's as your variables. But yeah, this is just merely a symbol over here. Another way you can write this as well is, well, you can think of this guy as an operator on your function f. So you can write this as a del by del xi at a p, but acting on f. And now if you stare at this, this tangent vector that was acting on f, if you take a look at this guy over here, it was acting on f, and then we can rewrite it as follows. This is just notation, All right? So this tangent vector, we can write it in this form over here. And in fact, whenever you see this sort of expression, you should really think about this definition of how it's defined. So this is what you should think of, this line over here. So really take this as a definition over here. So if you want definition, whenever you see del by del xi at the point p acting on f, you should remember how this is really defined. This is defined to be, well, you want the chart representation of your function f. So what would that look like? The chart representation is f after x inverse. Okay, but then you want to differentiate this guy with respect to the i component. That's what the i here over here tells you. So you put a del i out over here. And then what you want to evaluate at p. But this is in the chart representation. You're differentiating in that chart representation. So you have to evaluate at the chart representation of the points p. So that's um, exactly what I wrote there. So whenever you see the symbol, you should really replace it with that. Okay, so these gamma i's over here, they produce precisely these tangent vectors, which is quite nice. And now what we need to do is, well, I'm claiming that the set of all these del by del xi evaluated at p, this indeed forms a basis. So the claim is that the set of all these guys, del by del xi, at the point p, where i goes from 1 up to dim m, this is obviously, these are just tangent vectors over here, this is definitely a subset of tpm. I claim that this is a basis. Okay, so how do we show that something is a basis? We need to show that it's spanning and it's linearly independent. So let's show the spanning property first. This shouldn't be too bad to do, I think. So spanning. First of all, we're going to let x be an element of TPM. So we're just going to pick some random tangent vector. And because this guy is a tangent vector, um, it's produced by some smooth curve from R to M. So there exists some curve gamma that goes from R to M. And also we assume that a zero gets mapped to P such that this x vector that we wanted over here is equal to this tangent vector x generated by this curve gamma at the point P. Okay, so we want to understand this tangent vector x over here. So let's just pick a smooth function f. So we're going to let, once again, f be an element of c infinity m. And let's apply this vector x to f. So what is exactly x applied to f? Well, that's exactly going to be x gamma p evaluated or acting on f, but we know how to apply tangent vectors to functions. That's exactly function after curve derivative at exactly zero. And just like before, I don't want to have this curve gamma hanging around. I want to replace it with some chart, ideally. So let's rewrite this guy as f after x inverse, after x, and then this is after gamma, and this whole thing is evaluated at zero. And now I'm going to apply the multivariable chain rule once again. So let's remember how that works over there. So we have a derivative with respect to the eighth component. We take the outside function, which is which I'm taking as f after x inverse in this case, I evaluate it at the inside. So the inside stays the same. So that's going to be gamma of zero is p, and then we're just going to have x of p left. Oh, you might notice this over here. That's precisely, well, this guy down over here, but we'll replace that later. And then what else do we have? We have this inside derivative that needs to be taken care of. So we need to take the eighth 
component, so xA, and then after gamma, we differentiate this guy and evaluate at precisely equal to zero. Let's actually replace these indices with i's here, doesn't really matter. So this guy over here, that's precisely that tangent vector we defined before. And we also have this constant out over here as well. This is a number, it's a real number, because we're evaluating this real valued map at zero, so it's, it's a real number. This, I'm going to give a symbol, I'm just going to call it, well we have an up index i here, so I'm going to write it as big X and then I. Okay, let's put that first over here, so we have X and then up I, and then this guy over here, well that's exactly the symbol, del by del X I, but then I evaluate this guy at P, because of this X of P here, but then this X on F. Okay, but then you may realize something, we started off with this X acting on F here, and then what we get is XI times this tangent vector acting on F. So because this F was chosen arbitrarily, that means that this tangent vector X is precisely equal to XI, where XI are real numbers, times these tangent vectors. And of course, there's an implicit sum over here because we have an up index and a down index. So what we've managed to do is we've managed to write a tangent vector x to be equal to, we have these xi's over here, which are well, real numbers, we call these the components, and then we have these basis elements, or what we claim to be basis elements. So that's del by del xi, um, evaluated at p. So indeed, these del by del xi, these derivative operators, do indeed span the whole set TPM, because we can write every single vector x in TPM as a linear combination here. And yeah, these xi's I told you before, these are called the components. Okay, and there's one last thing to do, which is to show linear independence, and then we're done with this video. Um, so now to show linear independence, we do need one small ingredient, I guess. I need to do a proof, which I don't think I did in, I think it was video number four on differentiability. Um, the claim is, so before we show linear independence, I'm going to make a claim over here, and um, that's the maps x, I, which are maps from, well, what is it? We have M to R. These are smooth. So XI, these are just the chart component maps. So X, if you just have X, it's a map from M to, or well, technically U. What am I doing over here? This should be U. So X is a map from U into RD, but we're only picking out the I component. And the claim is that these are smooth. Well, that's a little bit funny to think about if you really do think about it, because you're going from M into a chart representation. Well, how do you know if that's differentiable or not? Well, remember how we defined a smoothness in video number four, was we took a look at everything in chart representations. So indeed, if you take a look at this map over here in its chart representation, it is smooth, because, well, what you do is for this U over here, you can just go down into X of U via the chart map X, and then from this R here, you can just take the identity, you treat R as a manifold here, and then you just take the identity on R down to R. Well, technically it should be XI of U, but XI of U is a subset of R anyway, so we have XI of U over here. And how do you judge the differentiability of a map going from U to XI of U in this case? Well, we take a look at this chart representation of the map. Um, so what is this map over here that takes you from XU to XU? It's a precisely identity after XI, after x inverse, because we have to go up from here, but um, well, identity doesn't change anything, then we're just left with xi after x inverse. But xi after x inverse, that's precisely the projection map. So this map going over here in this direction, that's precisely the projection onto the ith component. And the projection onto the ith component is definitely a smooth map. You can differentiate that, obviously. Um, so yes, indeed, these chart maps over here, or these chart component maps, are indeed smooth. And why do we need that? Well, we need that to show these, this linear independence here, which is what we're after, to finish the video. So linear independence. So how do we show linear independence over here? Well, we're going to take a zero, first of all, and we're going to set it equal to a linear combination of these basis elements that we want to show. That it's a basis, of course, so it's del by del xi at the point of P. Okay, now just be careful because these guys over here, these are tangents and vectors. Um, this is a linear combination of tangents and vectors, so the zero isn't a zero in the real numbers, this is a zero in the vector space, the tangent vector space. 
Okay, and now we have this vector over here. What I'm going to do is I want to apply this tangent vector to a very specific smooth functions because tangent vectors are supposed to eat smooth functions. And well, the smooth function, you might have guessed it, I'm going to apply it to are these xi's over here. So I'm going to take this tangent vector, apply it to these xi's over here. Actually, I'm going to write this as xa, just so we have different indices. And now if we do that, well, this tangent vector is eating this smooth function. That's going to give you a real number. We're taking a linear combination of real numbers over here. So, in fact, this turns this zero into actually the real number zero, not a tangent, not a, not a directional derivative operator anymore. Okay, so now we have tangent vector acting on smooth functions, specifically these basis elements here. So we have to remember how do we define basis elements acting on tangent vector? Well, we look over here and we see what we have. So we have x i, so this is going to give us lambda, well, this is still lambda i still. We have the derivative in the i direction. And then we take function after chart map inverse. So function is x a, chart map inverse is x inverse. And then what we do is we evaluate at the chart representation of the points p. But that is going to be x of p. Okay, and what we do from here, well, let's, let's stare at this for a little bit. x a after x inverse, remember if you go from your chart up to the manifold, which is x inverse, and then you go down via the eighth component, that's precisely the projection map onto the eighth component. So we're differentiating the projection map pretty much. So this is going to give us lambda i derivative projection map onto the eighth component. And then this guy is being evaluated at x of p. Okay, but what exactly is the derivative in the i-th direction of the projection onto the eighth component. Well, if i and a are equal, you're basically just differentiating the identity map, which is just going to give you one. But if i and a are different, well, you're going in two different directions. You're projecting onto one component, but then you're differentiating with respect to another component, which well, the projection doesn't care about, so it's going to give you zero. So in fact, this derivative over here is going to give you the Kronecker delta of a i. Okay, and then you evaluate this Kronecker delta of ai at x of p. Remember, Kronecker delta is just a constant, so this x of p doesn't really matter. So what you end up getting is this lambda i Kronecker delta of ai. Okay, and then we have a contraction, so i and i, with the Kronecker delta. So only when i and a are equal, this product here survives. So this is going to give us, in the end, just lambda of a. Okay, so what do we see over here? We have this real number zero. This is equal to lambda a. But wait a minute, lambda a, so these are all the lambdas here, and we could have picked, if we just run through all these smooth functions we can evaluate on, so x1 up to x to the dim m, we're going to see that all these lambda a's over here are equal to zero. And that's precisely what we want to show for linear independence. Um, and yeah, that's basically all for that claim there. That's the set of all these tangent vectors do indeed form a basis. So that's called the chart induced basis up over there. And just a bit of a corollary from this proof here, because we have dim m many basis elements over there, that means that the dimension of the tangent space of TPM is precisely equal to the dimension of the manifold. And notice these are really two different dimensions over here. This is the vector space dimension, um, because TPM is a vector space. And over here, this is a manifold dimension, which is defined in terms of charts. But those two dimensions there, they coincide, which is quite nice. So if you have a, I don't know, three-dimensional manifold, your tangent spaces are always going to be three-dimensional. Okay, so that's pretty much everything for this video. That's the proof that this set over there is a basis for your tangent space. In the next video, I'll probably do something like completing the proof of the closure property of TPM because I haven't done that. And we'll probably take a look at change of basis of components as well because we'll probably need that when we take a look at cotangent spaces and all that fancy jazz that we're going to see later. And yeah, maybe some examples. But anyway, that's going to be all for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And yeah, up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day. And I'll see everyone in the next one. Bye-bye.